tonight we'll be hearing from Dr. Sally Winston. She is a clinical psychologist and a founding partner and co-director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland in Towson, Maryland. She's a nationally recognized psychologist for her expertise in the treatment of anxiety disorders. She co-founded the Anxiety Disorders Clinic at Shepherd Pratt Hospital in 1978, where she served as senior psychologist until 1992. And she has served as chair of the Clinical Advisory Board of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and was the first recipient of the ADAA Geraldine Ross Clinician Advocate Award in, 2000, in 2011. She is the former chair of the ADAA Public Education Committee. And I have just lost internet connection. So again, I'm so sorry. Please bear with me. Um, but I will keep talking. Uh, she's a former chair of the ADAA Public Educa Education Committee, which uh, established these webinars. And she's appeared on the A&E television program, Hoarders. Before we begin the presentation, let me tell you a little bit about ADAA, if you don't already know. It was started in 1979, and today it's the leading nonprofit dedicated to increasing awareness and education about anxiety disorders and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, practice, and research. ADAA fights to end stigma by promoting the message that anxiety disorders and depression are real, serious, and treatable. Please visit the ADA website, which is www.adaa.org which includes find a therapist, a searchable database of treatment providers, as well as free educational information and resources, self-tests, self-help groups, clinical trials, and a lot more. And I'd also like to call your attention to something we have, which is called Misconceptions. We'll tell you some of the answers to uh, the myths that are commonly uh, told about anxiety, and Sally is going to dispel some of those myths and tell you what you can expect uh, with uh, the reality checks of anxiety. You can also support ADAA's efforts, such as this webinar series, by making a charitable contribution on the ADA website. We appreciate any contributions at any time and any amount. And remember, you can type in a question at any time. Now I'll turn this over to Dr. Winston. Hi, Sally. Hi there, and hello to everybody who's here. Uh, welcome. I hope that I'll be able to uh, answer as many of your questions, and please feel free to type them in at any point. And um, I'm going to rely on uh, Dean to let me know what the questions are so that I can pay attention to talking. Um, what I'm going to try to do is just talk a little bit about some of the things that a lot of people think they know about anxiety and that actually may not be exactly the way you might expect. Um, there's a lot written all the time about anxiety and stress in uh, magazines, on the internet, and all over the place there, there's access to information. But what we at ADAA are really interested in letting you know the kinds of information that come from the scientific research that is done about anxiety disorders and that has really burgeoned in the last 30 years. So what I'm going to be talking about is not the kind of anxiety that everybody has, and as we know, everybody has anxiety as part of the human condition, but about anxiety disorders, which is when anxiety gets so bad that it interrupts your life, it causes a great deal of distress, it uh, makes you avoid things or lose out on the pleasures of life because it's, it's gotten in your way. So way more than the ordinary amount of anxiety that everybody has. And the anxiety disorders are phobias, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and something called generalized anxiety disorder, which is basically a lot of worrying and not being able to relax. So the first myth that I'd like to talk about is this myth that anxiety disorders are caused by stress 
So reducing or eliminating stress will make you better. And that's really what most people do when they feel a lot of anxiety, is they try to get stress out of their lives. And what you may have discovered is that that may not, in fact, help your anxiety disorder. The reason is that anxiety disorders, like actually almost all emotional and physical disorders, are reactive to stress. They're sensitive to stress. They certainly get worse under stress, but they're not actually caused by stress. So what that means is it's certainly true that if you have panic disorder, you might be more likely to have it if you have a, have a panic attack or feel like you're going to have a panic attack if you hadn't had enough sleep and a lot of people are mad at you and uh, you've had a lot of coffee. All of that might make it Make, make it more likely that you're going to have a panic attack. But that's not actually the cause. The causes of all the anxiety disorders are pretty complicated. It's usually a combination of genetics or your inheritance, what you were born with. Anxiety disorders, all of them, including phobias, actually run in families. Um, and uh, we know a lot more than we used to about how it is that they run in families, both genetically, so that a predisposition to anxiety is genetic, but also in families there are life experiences, how you were raised, what you've been through, if there have been stressful experiences in childhood uh, or in adulthood, and also a combination of traits, which are basically enduring habits of the mind, ways of thinking and behaving and feeling that are part of a person's general makeup. And all of the anxiety disorders are due to a combination of these things, sometimes more genetic, sometimes more experiences, but a combination of all of them. So it's very similar. A good analysis would be like diabetes. Certainly we know that diabetes is worse under stress. And if you have stress management tools like exercise, you can make your diabetes a little bit better. But most people with diabetes actually have to address what's underneath that. And that is so they need to talk about and change how they eat, what they eat, how they relate to what they eat, and frequently they need insulin or some other combination of medicines to address the underlying problem of the diabetes. So it's the same with anxiety disorders. Um, it is, if you just try to do the things that avoid stress, you may not actually make anything better. In fact, Sometimes it makes no dent at all, and sometimes it's very demoralizing because you can exercise regularly, you can start to eat healthily, avoid caffeine, you might even change your job or um, stop a relationship with somebody that's causing you stress, but somehow or other you still end up with your panic attacks or your phobias or some other tendency to worry a great deal. It's not enough of a help. Much more effective than just reducing the amount of stress in your life are treatments that focus on the underlying issues. That can be issues like anxiety sensitivity, which is kind of the fear of anxiety symptoms, which is part of panic disorder when you're afraid of your anxiety or you're avoiding your anxiety or you're scared of the symptoms of arousal in your body, that can cause you to have a worse time with anxiety. People who are perfectionistic, people who have a sticky mind, and that's usually a genetic thing, a tendency for your thoughts to get stuck and go round and round and round an anxious body type, 
people, again, are born with a body type that may be, have a tendency to have a harder time relaxing. So treatments that focus on these things are more effective. And there's another ingredient to treatment that's really, really important. And that is to look at the things that you do consciously or things that you're not aware of that you do to maintain your anxiety, such as avoiding things, seeking a great deal of reassurance, trying not to let yourself get anxious, which actually is one way of making you anxious, and all the things that go on in your life that, um, that make you have a greater tendency to be sensitized, to have your body and your mind um, be much more likely to have anxiety symptoms like panic attacks, phobia, worrying. So again, just reducing the stress is likely not to be helpful. And the other thing that happens is actually reducing stress can end up being counterproductive. Because if you back away from anything that makes you anxious, that actually can develop into avoidant behavior. It can actually reinforce your fears and your worry. Let's say that you're driving and you have a scary thought that you're driving that uh, you're worried that you might get dizzy and not be able to drive, or you worry that you have a very strange thought that pops into your head that you could just yank the wheel and drive into the next lane and cause an accident. If you decide that maybe you shouldn't be driving, or if you decide that you'd rather be a passenger whenever there's a chance, then you kind of stop driving, or you only drive near your house, or you start only driving when you only have to go below 30 miles an hour. This actually is how phobias develop, by avoiding things that make you feel anxious or stressed, if you want to use that word, you actually can develop your fears worse and worse. And if you start avoiding, then you start avoiding more kind of catching. The other thing is that if you don't learn how to face your fears in a different way, and you simply avoid the things that you're scared of, then you start to back away from things that were perfectly normal and fine in your life, and you start to feel bewildered. What's wrong with me? Why am I acting like that? I used to be able to shop by myself. I used to be able to go anywhere I wanted. What's happening to me? Am I falling apart? Am I going crazy? What's happening? And that bewilderment can increase and increase the more you avoid. You start to feel like you're fragile or that, that you've got to be protective of yourself. And that makes you even more avoidant. You start relying on other people to do things for you, even if you've never been someone like that. So that's another way in which avoiding stress can be counterproductive. The other thing is that a lot of the things that people think are stressful are actually embedded in what they enjoy and value. Maybe you actually love your job. Uh, maybe it's a very, very busy job. Maybe it's even a stressful job. But if you quit your job because you're starting to feel scared of everything, then you're losing out on what's important in your life. And if, for example, you're afraid to be alone with your own children because what if you have a panic attack or you're afraid to do things for other people or take risks, then you stop having excitement and fun in your life. And that can make you depressed. So there are a lot of reasons why avoiding stress is not the right way to go about handling anxiety disorders. I hope that makes some sense. Here's the second myth. If someone is anxious, a never-ending supply of reassurance and loving help and helping people to avoid whatever it is they're scared of and reassuring them over and over and over again if they need it, 
that that's the best way to go, that love will conquer all. Now, we all know that if someone you care about is anxious, all you want to do is wrap your arms around them and take care of them and make them comfortable and make the anxiety somehow go away just because you're right there. Whoops, I just hit this. All right, sorry for that. Um, have you noticed, however, that if you give a reasonable amount of reassurance to an anxious person, Sometimes it doesn't actually work, and they come back for more and more and more reassurance. If you have somebody check in with you when they get wherever they're going, then they start checking in with you before they go, and then they start checking in with you the night before they go just to find out that you believe everything is going to be okay. Or if somebody is worried that maybe the spot on their arm might be cancer and they ask the doctor and the doctor says, no, it's not, and then they go, they go home and they feel a lot better for about an hour and then they start looking at pictures of cancer on people's arms again and then they want to find another doctor and then they call you. And it seems to just go on and on and on endlessly. Um, the reassurance doesn't seem to stick with people who have anxiety disorders. And sometimes even the person who's asking for reassurance knows what the answer is, but they can't help asking because that reassurance is just a temporary help to them and they just want to make sure that you're okay or that they're okay. Now, why is it that this happens? Well, there's something that happens with people who have anxiety problems. They have a particular kind of problem, which is that they have what we call an intolerance of doubt. They have trouble dealing with uncertainty. And they want to be certain. Well, what they don't realize is that certainty and uncertainty are actually feelings they're not facts. There's an awful lot, practically everything, that you can't really know for sure. But for anxious people, this is sometimes very, very difficult to bear. For example, if you think right now about someone that you love and that you care about, and I want you to really do this, think about somebody, and then let me ask you, do you know for sure that they're alive right now? Now, that can be pretty startling when you think about it. Most people will say, oh, yes, I just talked to them um, an hour ago or yesterday or last week, so I know they're fine. But the fact is, if you really think about it, something could have happened that you don't yet know about. Now, for most people, we just kind of you know, put up with that, that we're, we're reasonably sure, but we're not 100% sure, but we don't get panicked at the thought that we don't know for absolute 100% sure. We can bear a little bit of doubt, even about things that are that important. We can never know for sure that, that ourselves or our loved ones will stay safe and healthy and be happy forever and ever. We can't even be sure of what another person is thinking or feeling. We can ask them, but they could tell us, you know, they could tell us whatever they want to tell us, and we wouldn't know that for sure. We also can't be sure that we'll never make a mistake or that we haven't made a mistake that we don't even know about. We can't be sure we're not accidentally causing a problem or doing something wrong. And people with anxiety have a very hard time when they realize that, when they have a thought like, well, what if I did something and I don't realize it and it's causing somebody else a problem? That thought by itself can set off a bunch of worrying, even though it's really true that we can't actually be sure of hardly anything. So worrying gives us an illusion of preparing for or preventing bad things but it's really just an illusion. Learning how to tolerate uncertainty is a key for dealing with people who are uh, needing reassurance all the time.
So one of the best treatments for anxiety has to do with learning how to tolerate doubt and learning that even though your mind may be screaming at you, make sure or check the facts again or, you know, you, you can't do that because you, what if it gave you a heart attack? The ultimate solution for people with anxiety is to learn how to take that leap of faith called good enough or likely but not certain, you can't know for sure, but I'm going to go with a little risk. So anxious people have to learn. It doesn't come automatically. They have to learn, and it's hard, accepting that you have to not only you have to accept things that you can't control, but also things that you can't know, and somehow carry on and live gracefully and joyfully in the present, not always trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Sally, let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Can you tell people a little bit, very briefly, how, how they can go about learning to accept uncertainty? Um, is that working with a therapist? Is it through self-help? Is it through both or other things? What, what do you recommend? Well, um, it, absolutely working with a therapist who understands anxiety and who can teach you to tolerate doubt um, is very helpful. Certainly it can also be done by self-help, and there's some very good self-help books that kind of discuss things like that. Jonathan Grayson has a book called Living with Uncertainty, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And a lot of that book is actually about how to tolerate doubt. But the first thing that you can do is realize that you tolerate doubt all the time on some things. For example, you may be somebody who uh, drives your car every day and never has a second thought about it. Uh, you don't actually know that everything in your car is working perfectly, but you just kind of accept that you don't know that. Um, if you're somebody who struggles with doubt in another arena, if you find something that you do know how to tolerate doubt, then you take those same, uh, those same ways that you tolerate not knowing, and you see that you actually have that skill. Then what you do is you present yourself with the thing that you're doubting about and having trouble doubting about. And you learn to just tell yourself, this is uncomfortable, but it's a feeling. It's not a fact. It's an uncomfortable feeling, and I'm just going to let myself have that feeling. And you can do that through self-help or therapy, um, and, but it's an important piece of getting better. Great. Thank you. Okay. So for family and friends, repetitive reassurance over and over and over again doesn't actually help people to learn how to tolerate doubt. Uh, even though it's coming from a good place, it's actually not particularly helpful. And actually, the anxious person seems to get more and more dependent or demanding. So what you have to do is be very empathic and compassionate but help people to face uncertainty, to move towards the things that they're scared of instead of helping them to move away. If somebody's scared that they might have a panic attack in a grocery store, shopping for them, although it seems like such a nice idea, is actually not going to be helping them because they need to, in manageable steps, they need to go towards what's scaring them and not away. Now, that doesn't mean you, you, know, you, you force anything, but you cooperative kind of nudge and help, and you tell people how brave they are to face their fears instead of ask you to make their fears go away. So you encourage them to face what's scaring them. And what's scaring them could be thoughts, it could be places, or it could be activity. Myth number three. Depression and anxiety have their origins in childhood, so it's necessary to find childhood causes and fix them. Oh, and look at that. There's a oh, typo nice. there. And, and, and that'll show you now I have to tolerate my little blow to my perfectionism. That's a pretty funny. So we'll next, fix it next time. <laughs> next time. 
It's certainly Good true enough. that childhood experiences, such as how you were raised and what happened when you were young, they can be an important part in the development of your anxiety. But what keeps anxiety going is really the issue, not where did it come from. Habits of the mind and anxious patterns of behavior that you have in the present are what keeps anxiety going, not the original causes. So looking, how, looking at how anxiety keeps itself going, however it got started, is more immediately helpful. An example of this would be that um, if, for example, you have panic attacks, it may well be that the first panic attack happened during a period of great stress or conflict or um, physical problem that you were having, the panic attack started that way. But now what keeps your panic attacks going is how you react when you start to get the very beginnings of symptoms, either a scary thought or maybe a little bit of lightheadedness or a little rapid heart rate, how you react to that, if you're scared of it or you're mad at it or you try to deal with it in, a, in, a, in the wrong kind of way, that's what keeps your anxiety going, not the original cause. So what you want is the kind of therapy that focus on, focuses on what maintains anxiety, not what the causes are. Not that the causes aren't interesting, they are, but they're not going to be enough to get you out of the situation that you're in now. Cognitive behavior therapy is the kind of therapy that focus on what focuses on the here and now, what is keeping your anxiety going. It emphasizes education so that you know exactly what's going on that feels dangerous or scary or out of control so that you don't add fear, you don't add shame, you don't worry about worry and you can learn new ways to deal with your symptoms. It teaches you how to change your relationship with your anxiety so that it doesn't run your life, it doesn't make you feel bad about yourself, it doesn't limit your life, you don't make decisions about what you're going to do based on whether or not it's gonna make you anxious. And the education includes a lot of details about what's happening so that you can understand uh, thoughts and feelings, things like understanding how to tolerate doubt, basic facts like when you're having a panic attack, your blood pressure is going up, not down, so you can't faint, basic facts like that, and understanding that it's not your personality, it's not weakness, it's your genetic predisposition and some things that happened that make you be, that had made you be anxious. It's not your fault. Ellie, on the point of um, physical side effects of panic, a question has come in asking if anxiety can cause physical pain or discomfort. Uh, yes, um, there are many ways in which anxiety can cause physical pain or discomfort, and that physical pain and discomfort are real. They are not in your mind, they're not imaginary, they're real. But what's really important about that physical pain or discomfort is it's not dangerous. So for example, if you have a great deal of muscle tension because you're anxious, that can cause real pain. And if you have muscle tension in your chest wall, you can have something that feels like a heart attack. Or if you have anxiety that affects you in your digestive tract, you can have reflux, and you can have other things that can give you pain that's absolutely real. But what's important to know about that pain is that it's not dangerous. And if if you know it's not dangerous, then you don't add more pain by being freaked out about it. But certainly you can have pain. And how about nausea? Nausea it comes um, from a lot, a lot of anxiety um, does have nausea accompanying it. Not usually vomiting if you're over 20, but nausea. That comes from your digestive tract kind of shutting down when you're anxious. It's not usually um, 
uh, something that just comes and goes quickly. It can go along with anticipatory anxiety. When you're worrying about something in the future, you can feel nauseated. You can also feel nauseated if you see something that not only makes you feel afraid, but makes you feel disgusted. And that can give you nausea, too. And that's from a feeling, again, not dangerous, but very uncomfortable. If you, it, one of the things that we know, and, and you may know this already because it's been in the press a lot, is that our digestive tracts have as much neurotransmitters or more the chemicals that we have in our brain that have to do with anxiety, they are just as present in the digestive tract as they are in the brain. So a lot of people have their anxiety in their guts instead of their brain or in addition to their brain. That's where the nausea comes from. OK? Good. Good answer. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, no, let's keep going. OK. We, Miss? Me, we do have questions for the people who are writing questions, but I think some of those might be addressed later. We'll OK, well, we can, can get to them later if we've got yeah. time. Myth number four, if you fight negative thoughts with positive thoughts, they will go away. Um, usually when I say this to an audience of anxious people, they start laughing because they've all tried it, and they know already that that doesn't actually work, although everybody tells them to try that. Actually, fighting thoughts works backwards. We call that paradoxical. Actually, unwanted thoughts tend to get stronger and more repetitive if you struggle with them or if you yell at them or you try to replace them with better thoughts or you argue back. The more intention you pay to trying to think good thoughts and not bad thoughts, the more your anxiety goes up, not down. And then you start being mad at yourself because it's not working. We can forcefully distract ourselves, but only temporarily. A lot of anxious people have battles inside their head between what they call their rational self and their irrational self, or their what if and their calm down. And it goes on and on and on inside their head. It goes round and round. You really can't actually make yourself stop thinking something. If you just stop for a moment, I'm going to give you a little demonstration. What I'd like you to do right now is absolutely make sure for the next few seconds that you have no thought or image or idea of an elephant. You should have no elephant in your head, not the word elephant, no picture of an elephant, nothing to do with elephants right now. OK, clear of elephants. Just put something nice in there, like the beach, or well, maybe a picture of someone you care about, something positive. No elephant, right? Go. Now, my guess is that just about everybody had an elephant intruding into that picture. And that is because of the way minds work. When we try to suppress or control our thoughts, one part of our mind goes to the new distracting thoughts that we want to put in there. But another part stays back to monitor and make sure that the old thought you don't want won't come back. It's like standing at the door of a party trying to keep someone out. You can't really enjoy the party much. Now, if it doesn't matter to us what our thoughts are, the monitor who's trying to keep the old thoughts out gets is kind of relaxed. And it's pretty easy to put most of your attention on the new thing. That's how we go from focusing on one thing to focusing on the next thing, like focusing on the TV, and then making your sandwich, and then eating your sandwich, and then answering the phone. If none of it matters very much what's in your mind, it's easy to go from one thing to the next. But if it's really, really important not to think about something, then the monitor in your mind gets very, very vigilant and scared and rigid and powerful and energetic. And it stands at the door and says, don't come back. And that's what reintroduces all the negative thoughts, all the banned thoughts over and over and over. That's what we call a paradoxical or ironic process. That's why replacing bad thoughts with good thoughts doesn't actually work. 
the key to unwanted thoughts is make the thoughts not matter. They're thoughts. We're not responsible for what thoughts arise in our minds. It's not up to us. It just happens. There's a lot of junk in our minds. We're responsible absolutely for what we do, but not for what thoughts happen into our minds. Wild worries and what ifs, if you give them attention and importance, uh, they, they come forward. If you don't dignify them with answering them or dealing with them or trying to keep them out, then they gradually find a back seat, go somewhere else, stop bothering you. But if you, if you keep paying attention to them by trying to make them go away, they get stronger. Um, let me give you one metaphor, but most people find their own way of thinking about this. Imagine that you're driving on the road. It's a, it's a dirt road. Um, it used to be raining, and um, it's still a little bit wet, but the sun is shining. So as you're driving along, all of a sudden, there's a splat of mud in the middle of your windshield, about the size of your hand. And in the middle of the splat, there's half of a disgusting, yucky bug. All right? That's your thought you don't want. Now, you've got some choices. You can decide that you absolutely can't stand having that there, and you put on the windshield wipers. What do you get? You get smeared bug and mud all over the whole the whole windshield. Or what you can decide is that actually you can see to dry. And you can't pretend the spot's not there. You can't pretend that there's nothing there, but you can drive. So you just keep on driving. What happens is it dries up and it flakes off. And by the time you get where you're going, your windshield is clear and clean, and there's no big mess to clean up. And that's one metaphor I like to give people. I also like to encourage people to find your own, because a lot of people come up with some really good ones of being able to have something that you're aware of but that you don't really care about right there in your mind. Does, but I always get some objections. Isn't it true that we ought to think about anything that we're thinking? If something crosses my mind, isn't it important to understand it? Doesn't it mean something if something crosses my mind? If I have a worry, doesn't that mean there's a reason for that worry that I should look at? Actually, no. We have all kinds of random associations and junk thoughts in our, in our minds. We have lots and lots and lots of channels operating simultaneously all the time. And we can swing our attention from one channel to the other, but we can't turn them off. Um, the do I have to go to the bathroom channel is pretty much on all the time, but I can't say that most of us are watching it all the time. Sometimes there are some anxious people who are watching it a great deal of the time. But any time you want to check in with that channel, it's on. It's on. You can find it. Many thoughts are just not worth attending to. It's like having a pop-up on your computer. You know, you're working on your computer, and then the pop-up ad comes, and you hit the X or the delete, and it goes away. But anxious thoughts can pop up with no X in the corner. And you just kind of have to wait till the ad runs out. We don't know exactly. Maybe it's 15 seconds. Maybe it's five minutes. You can Maybe you can drag it a little bit to the side. But if you get involved in having to get rid of it, I guarantee you, you'll keep clicking on it. And it will open up. And then you have to watch the whole thing. And then it comes back. You don't want to get engaged with those pop-ups. Make sense? And let me tell you, Charlie, we have about 20 minutes to go. OK. Well, I'm going to have time to answer questions. This is myth number five. If you're having a panic attack, try everything you can to relax. That seems pretty sensible. Have you noticed that this one works backwards, too? At the peak of a panic attack, your brain is issuing a false alarm. This is your body's fight or flight reaction. It's an emergency response that's gone on when there's no actual emergency. 
very uncomfortable, but it's not the least bit dangerous. I like to call it a cardiovascular workout you didn't ask for. It's exactly the same thing that happens when you pay to go to a scary movie so you could get scared. You can't relax immediately because there's a part of your brain which is part of what we call the fear circuit. That part of your brain is called the amygdala. It's just fired off a false alarm. And you don't have a turn off switch. And so you've got to let it run its course. If you try to make yourself stop having a panic attack, you keep it going by being scared of it. And the key to panic is allowing time to pass while panic fixes itself. As you basically just run out of adrenaline. Here's another car thing I'm going to tell you about, another metaphor. Uh, you're driving another car. This car is constructed like a human body. What's weird about this car is that it has a gas pedal, but it has no brake. That's the way that's the way the brain is. It has a gas pedal, but it has no brake. So you're driving along, it's 55 miles an hour, you're on a straightaway, you're out in the middle of the desert, there's absolutely nothing you could possibly hit, there's no other traffic, and you're just driving along. Then you decide that you'd like to stop. So you got a few choices here, right? One of them is to refuse to believe that there's no brake. So what will happen is that you're going to frantically be looking for that brake and getting more and more panicked. You're going to crash around the car. You're going to hit the brake by accident with your left foot and your right foot and your knee. And you're going to be um, you know, veering around on the road trying to find the brake. And you just keep going really fast. The alternative is to just take your foot off the gas. Then what happens is you don't stop right away, but you start slowing down, and then the car stops on its own once the time has passed and it's run out of gas. That's how to handle a panic attack. You take your foot off the gas, and you let it coast to a stop. What's taking your foot off the gas? That's knowing certain facts about panic which is it won't hurt you, you can't pass out, you're not going crazy, you're not going to lose control, this is an adrenaline surge, uncomfortable but not dangerous. You talk to yourself like that, and you just don't do anything to try to stop it. And it will run out of gas, and then it will be over. So it's your attitude towards that panic going to make a huge difference. Now, I'd like to take whatever questions people have um, and answer any other myths that people might have any questions about. Okay, here's a question um, from someone who says, why is it that only medication is able to control my anxiety? It's not really a myth, but that it seems to be something that this, that this person is, is curious about. Well, you know, a lot of people believe that because anxiety is physical, that they have to do something physical like medicine to, uh, to make their anxiety go away. But actually, what, there are ways to affect how your body is reacting and how your mind is reacting by how you think and by the attitude that you have. If what you're trying to do is fight it and control it and make it go away, then that is actually not particularly helpful. That tends to work backwards. But if your anxiety, if you treat your anxiety as something that's only uncomfortable but doesn't have to be controlled, then it will tend to resolve on its own. We're talking about a panic attack. It's the fear of the panic attack that makes the panic worse. If you get so that you're not scared of it, 
then actually it's a very short life thing. And then you stop dreading it so much because it's not so important that you not have one because you're not so scared of it. And then that makes you less sensitized. And then what that does is you start doing more stuff and you're happier and it happens less often. And then it stops happening. So there is a way out that isn't just medicine. Certainly medicine can be helpful. And I'm not, I'm not putting down medicine. But there is also a way to get right at your brain through how you think and your attitude. If we think about it, if, um, if you just imagine biting into a lemon, all right? Just imagine that really vividly, biting into a lemon. It's a really juicy lemon. And what you'll notice is, I'm hoping, that the back of your throat is feeling funny, and maybe you're salivating a little bit, and there's an actual real physical change happening in your mouth and your throat, including a lot of saliva. And that's just from your own imagination. There's no actual real lemon here. Our imaginations are incredibly powerful, and they do affect our brain. And when you think different ways, you can go into a, 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 a brain imaging machine like an MRI or a PET scan, and you can, you can actually watch the fear circuitry in the brain change depending on how you're thinking about it, how you're imagining, how you're breathing what your attitudes are. You can actually watch your brain change. So medicine is one way to get at your brain, but there are other ways as well. Um, and before we leave the topic of medication, uh, are there are some medications that are better than others that people might want to know about? Well, there are medications that are better than others. Um, in general, the first line of medications are the ones that uh, uh, that are called antidepressants. They're called antidepressants, but they actually work very well for anxiety. And I like to think of them as anti-sticky meds, because they work for both anxiety and depression, sticky mind thought. They tend to make your thoughts kind of flow through more easily. They tend to help your mood, and that tends to help your anxiety. So that's often the kind of medicine that people are given, but that's something that's very much uh, to be discussed between a particular patient and their doctor. They all have, they're all slightly different, and they're all slightly different mostly in terms of their side effects. Um, there are medicines called benzodiazepines, things like clonopin and Xanax which do help anxiety in the short run, but in general, they don't teach you how to relate to your anxiety differently. They, don't, they, they tend to be something that works right away, but in the long run, you don't actually change. So you just end up taking the medicine when you're anxious, but you don't learn very much that way. But sometimes the antidepressants and the anti-anxiety medications like Xanax and Clonopin are taken together for a little while until the antidepressant starts working. OK, here's another question. Um, I asked my boss for one day off a week to help with my anxiety. Is this not going to be helpful for my anxiety? Um, well, you know, that's a terrific question. And it sounds like you were actually listening a lot to what I said. Um, it depends what you're going to do with that and how you're going to feel about it, whether that's going to be helpful. Um, if you're talking about taking a day off in order to be able to get to a therapy appointment and in order to have some time to face your fears or read some self-help books or start working on um, changing how you deal with your anxiety and you need that time off from work to do that, then that would make sense. But if you're just saying to take the stress off me, then you're going to sit at home feeling like a failure, like what's wrong with me, and that could easily end up being backfiring on you. Um, if you're wanting your day off because 
um, because there's something on that day you don't want to work that you're avoiding, then perhaps you can take the day off, but then start working in small steps towards whatever it is that you're avoiding so that you can then face it. Now, it's a complicated question. Of course, without knowing you and everything that's going on with you, I can't really answer that question personally for you. But I hear the fact that you asked that question, that you really were listening very hard to what I was saying. So that's a great question. And here's a question, too. Um, somebody said that um, they have nausea a lot from anxiety, and they're trying CBT. But what are some other tips you have to minimize the feeling? Um, is this similar to not dreading it or not fearing it? Um, well, what usually works best for nausea, um, aside from, I mean, you can take anti-nausea medication, but in order to work with the nausea, in order to get better, you probably need to do a very gradual exposure-based treatment, which means to, to very gradually in steps let yourself see or smell or think about something that makes you nauseous and tolerate that instead of backing away from it and let that be there for a while until it subsides and to gradually build up. And nausea is a little bit like um, like uh, uh, smelly socks. Here's a, here's a little a little metaphor. If you're let's say that you um, you have to go into a room to work for a while, and and um, that's the only place the computer is, so you have to work there. And you get into the room, and then you realize that in the corner of the room there's this huge pile of old athletic socks that need to be washed, and they've just been sitting there for weeks, and the room smells horrible and you start to feel nauseated and you start to feel really icky, but you have to, you have to stay there. So there's, there's two different ways to handle that. One is to go rushing out of the room every five minutes to try and get some fresh air and then go back in. And the other way is to just stay there until you get used to it. And what happens is if you stay there for half an hour, then after a while you don't even smell it anymore. And that's called habituation, or it's really a fancy word for getting used to. And what will happen is somebody else will come to the room, open the door, and say, oh, my God, how can you stand it in here? And you, you find yourself, oh, it's really not that bad. So sometimes with nausea-based anxiety, you have to do an exposure to whatever it is that's making you nauseous. And that's not easy to do. That is not easy to do. It takes courage. And it takes a lot of determination. But that can be very, very useful. And somebody else asks about um, longstanding treatment-resistant social anxiety disorder. Um, what to do about it? Yeah. Um, there are people, and you might want to check the ADAA website for a Find a Therapist section. To, See if you can find somebody locally who uh, treats social anxiety disorder. Um, probably the most helpful kind of treatment for a lot of people with social anxiety disorder is group therapy, because everybody in the room has the same problem, which is worrying about what everybody else is thinking. Um, and so groups are a really good way to treat social anxiety disorder if individual work has not been helpful. So if you can find somebody who's got a group, that would be an additional thing to, to be helpful. Um, there are, of course, medications that can help. Um, but you want to make sure that you're working with a specialist if you possibly can. There's also some pretty good books that you could read, because a lot of social anxiety disorder is really about tolerating a different feeling. It's not tolerating panic. It's not tolerating physical discomfort. It's not tolerating nausea. It's tolerating the feeling of being embarrassed or humiliated. And so once, if you're working with somebody who really understands that, that it's not being afraid of parties or people, it's being afraid of a feeling 
then the kind of work that you do is gradually learning how to tolerate that feeling. I hope that I, makes sense. Oh, it does to me. I hope it does to our uh, attendees. Um, I think we have time for one other question, which is a very good one. Uh, is anyone ever completely cured of anxiety? Well, that's a terrific question. You know, we don't like to use the word cure. We like to use the word recovery. And the reason is that you're never going to get to the place where you never have any anxiety at all ever, because that's just part of human life, is that you get anxiety sometimes. Everybody does. Um, and it's also probably that you have a genetic predisposition to get anxious. So what recovery means is that if you do have some anxiety, a worry thought or a, a weird thought or a strange sensation or an urge to run away from something and avoid it, that that doesn't run your life, that it doesn't make you feel bad, that you're not scared of it, that you're not angry at yourself for having it, that you don't change your mind about what you're going to do, that anxiety symptoms, when they occur, they don't really matter much. And if you can get to it doesn't matter much, then you're recovered. And you're inoculated for the next time that you get sensitized or you're in a rush or you had too much coffee or something happened and you got anxious. If the symptoms come up and they don't upset you and they don't take over your life, then that's recovery. And that is very attainable. That's, that is the goal. And there are lots and lots of people who can get there. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we've run out of time. And again, I apologize if we haven't been able to get to all of the questions. But I think you answered all the information about um, myths about uh, anxiety. And let me point out again the ADA website. If you look under Understanding the Disorders, and you, it's a drop-down menu, at the bottom is something called Misconceptions. And we've got a nice chart with some of these same myths and what the reality is. And then there's some helpful links that will tell you uh, where to find more information, particularly more help. And also on that page is how to find reliable information on the internet and what is not reliable sometimes on the internet, too. So thank you, everybody. And um, we will let you know when the recording is posted on the website. We hope this was helpful, and we hope you'll let others know about this series and consider making a contribution to ADAA.